Hello, Slash. It's nice to be back. Hey, David. So, hi, I'm Yussi. I'm here to talk about how to pivot, but more accurately, when to pivot. So let's get the show on the road. I want to talk you to you about, first about two fundamental truths. As you all know, when you're running a startup, you're running on willpower. When you run out of the willpower as founders, that is when the company dies. Not before, never before. When you give up, the startup dies. But I also want to talk about another fundamental truth, which is if you never give up, the startup also dies. That is, if you're chasing one dream you set out to do, and you never change direction, you never look the reality in face, and you just continue pick-headedly forward, you will also die. So the question we're trying to answer today is whether to persevere or whether to pivot. So hi, my name is Jussi Lakkonen, and this is my favorite animal, the cockroach. <laughs> Not really. Uh, the story goes that at GDC 2013, there were so many unicorn startups that got really fed up with that, and they said, I'm a cockroach founder. You cannot kill me. Because I will persevere, I will pivot, I will do whatever it takes to take this company further and farther. And that story ended up with my dear friend David, then acquiring my company to Unity, which is today a $50 billion market cap game technology powerhouse. Amplifier uh, powers, or the legacy of Amplifier powers Unity's ads business, built originally here in Helsinki and worth, well, a lot of money, and it's doing really well. And this was basically a result of two very hard pivots and many course corrections on the way. Today, I'm a co-founder and a CEO of a company called Noise, and you can find me on Twitter at UCL. Please ping me and ask me more questions there. So let's get to it. We have three topics that I want to touch upon today. That is the founder mindset. What is it and how you embody it? Two, it is when to pivot. And three, what is the most important thing when you pivot? If you remember one thing today, it is really going to be about this first session, the first part of this presentation, the founder mindset. What goes inside your head, because it's all about pivots, it's all about mentality, and what goes in our, inside, your, uh, inside your brain. So, what do I mean about that? Let's distill first down the responsibilities of a CEO. As a founding CEO, you will do many things, but the three most important things to me are, one, that you set and communicate the strategy of the company. Who are we? What are we here for? What are we going to do? This is so important to align the company and your scarce resources to make something happen. That is your number one responsibility. The second is you recruit and retain the team that can execute on the strategy. Without the team, you have nothing. And thirdly, you secure the resources, primarily funding in the case of startups. These are the three things you must do, and you must do well as a founding CEO. And in order to do them well, you know what? You must be a true believer. If you do not believe in a company's mission, how can you do these things? And by a true believer, I mean you, you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, I believe, and be honest with yourself. It is not something you fake, you show to a VC, yes, I believe. No, you're truly to your core. I, this is my company, we're working with this awesome team, we're going to make this happen, I believe we're going to get there. This has to be so physically embodied that you cannot say otherwise. You have to be truly religious about this. Because if you're not, how will you set the strategy? How will you communicate? How are we going to convince anybody? Yeah, I think we're going to go there, but I'm not quite sure. No. We are going to go there. It's going to happen. The world will change the way we think it's going to change. And how can you recruit and retain people to a high-risk endeavor like a startup? They have a really cushy job somewhere. They, are, they have a family and kids, and now like, come on on board. It's going to be all fun and games. No, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be awful, but we're going to change the world. Men wanted for a hazardous journey, safe return, not guaranteed. And in order to get that funding from a VC, they need to see that you believe, that you will go through whatever it takes in order to get to the goal, because otherwise, why give you money? So you need to be a true believer. But here's the hard part. Believing is kind of easy. The hard part is to understand that you are also very likely wrong. 
this is a schizophrenic ask. You have to believe, but you have to know you're very likely wrong. And this is, this is the, probably the thing that makes the job of a pre-market fit, early stage founding CEO life so difficult, because you need to do this, both of these things. You must doubt while you believe. Because the future will never happen as you imagine it today. It will change. There will be roadblocks on your way that you simply cannot get around. You have to change the direction. And every day, you're adjusting course a little bit. We're doing this, we're choosing that customer over that customer. That customer is telling us they need this, we're going to build that instead of that. You're always doing this anyway. And sometimes you're changing your direction quite drastically. Oh, actually, we thought we were going to price our product lot on a seed basis, but now we're going with subscription. And sometimes you will pivot. Maybe really hard. Oh, actually, we are not a business to consumer startup anymore. We're actually serving other startups like ourselves. This happened to us. We started as a gaming company. We failed miserably, but we built cross promotion tools for other gaming startups, and suddenly we were successful. We completely changed our business. Business to com consumer, to business to business, free to play to basically ads. Like, that's not a pivot. That's like a, throw the company all away and start again, basically, pivot. Now, how can you doubt yourself while being a true believer? I, I think this is just a really hard thing you need to learn to do. But now, I'm going to use an example from outside of startups. And this person here waving is James Stockdale. He's a highly decorated, recently a, a deceased uh, admiral in the US um, Army. And he was uh, captured in the, during the Vietnam War and went through unimaginable horrors and conditions uh, and torture. And his story is captured uh, by Jim Collins in the book Good to Great as the Stockdale Paradox. And it goes like this. You must maintain unwavering faith that you will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties, and at the same time, have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, however tough they may be. This was embodied on a prison camp in the Vietnam War, but it applies equally to startups. We will prevail, but I will face the reality. So let's talk about some tools that you can use for this founder mindset. The first tool is just simply embracing this duality that I've been talking about, this schizophrenia that I've been talking about. I, we will prevail, and I will face a reality. You cannot only run on belief, but you have to have that belief. Both things have to happen. Secondly, you have to believe what you're doing while realizing that you're wrong. And you are not going to give up, but you can give up on some things. This is a summary of what I said before, so it's nothing new here in terms of what we talked about. But this is the one thing, if you were to take something away, just take these things away and try and do these things, and it'll work much better. The second one, I think, is much more practical. To do those things on the previous slide, you need to be both a leader and a learner. It's not sufficient just to speak of lofty things and point the direction. You need to be out there learning on the ground and then adjusting your de decision making. The way to do that, you start with vision. You always lead with vision. We're going there, you s here's our strategy. And you want to, the people to understand this because they need to have a compelling direction to chase. And it doesn't matter if it's imperfect. You don't know every step there. You don't know everything that's going to happen. But you need to excite, compel, engage your team and your customers that we are going to do these things. We're going to democratize game development. A compelling vision by David for Unity. We're going to do this thing, and you can join this movement. It's imperfect. We don't know how it's going to happen. We don't know what it actually even means co completely, but it, it is motivating. We're going to be part of that mission. You can over-communicate this on every single chance you can of where we are going, because if you don't over-communicate, well, guess what? You don't have alignment. You're just constantly talking about what we're going to do, where we're going to go. And you're going to prioritize action over love to speak. You have a vision, but there are things to do. There's stuff to get done. There's no time to waste. We are doing things. We're not talking about the future. 
yes, we're going there, but now we cannot do actual things. Secondly, you have to learn as a company. The best way I know to learn as a company is to lean startup. And I know it's, it's, it feels like it's, oh, that's such an old thing. Don't you have anything new for us? You see, we heard about lean startup for 10 years now, and you're like, don't you have anything? No, actually, this is the best formalized methodology that you can use to learn as a company, which means, simply, you start with a vision, you craft test around that vision, you build that vision, you put it in the market with customers in a small way as possible, you test, you measure, you adjust. Build, test, measure, adjust. It's just a loop you execute as fast as you possible with the real customers, with as small increments as you can to learn as fast as possible. There's no substitute to learning from your customers because it forces you to face that reality we talked about. They are the reality. What do you need? Do you have the right customers? Do you need to fire your customer? Do you need to, need to change your product? Do you need to change your direction? The only way to know these things is to execute this type of learning loop. But that's not sufficient. It's required, but you, it's all, what's also required is you need to learn as an individual. The lean startup is what you do as a company. As an individual, you need to put yourself a little bit further out of your comfort zone. That is, you need to find out things that you're not testing for yet. You need to find out things that can challenge your viewpoints. And the only way to do that is you have to book some time to learn. You have to make it a priority by talking to your customers, your competitors, people don't yet use your product, that might use your product, talking to investors, and seeing what they say. Not that you believe everything to say, but to gather viewpoints that can challenge your viewpoints. You use your product with your end users, you go there, be one of them, and you search out for people that disagree with you. You try and answer, why do they disagree with me? What do they know that I do not know? You have to be <laughs> really curious about these things because it's not comfortable to talk to people that you disagree with. But it can help you learn a lot. So be a learner, but be a leader also. Tool three, you know what? As you start learning, you start doubting yourself. Oh my God, we are going to die. Oh, it's, it's not going to work out and it's, it's horrible. And they don't really love us. And, you know, and what happens if you tell everybody that? But what happens if you keep it all in your head and you have nobody to talk to? The best inner circle you'll have is your co-founders, the people who have the most aligned interests with you. They are in the same boat, they're going the same direction, and you need to talk with these people. And the best way to do that, you start when the problems are small. You start building that relation, that trust, by talking about those doubts you have. You talk about the things that you want to do together. Why are we doing this? Where are we going? Because when things get problematic, you need the trust and understanding how both of you operate, the three of you operate, the four of you operate, so that you can talk about the big problems as they come up and they are not, they are not an exception. They are part of your normal working practice to, is to handle those doubts and to learn as a team by setting goals. You know what? We don't know about this thing. You're going to go after that, I'm going to go after that, and we're going to come back and we're going to discuss what we learned. I'm of two minds of a board. I've had a great board with Petteri Kaupunen from Lifeline and Mark Sugarman uh, from Energy Capital, the board that I trusted, the board that I had my back. And I was incredibly fortunate to have a lot of good discussions with them. I was a really fetching entrepreneur when I started. I didn't really know much. And Petteri from Lifeline had, was a three-time repeat founder turned an investor, and he had a lot of time for me to coach me and push me, challenge me, and help me. So we had a lot of discussions uh, about what we were to do, but the one thing I think I did really well with, with my board members, and I established a practice of every board deck, I shared two things, and among other things like metrics and finances, I shared every time the first two slides being, what am I excited about? What's working? And then what do I worry about? What's not working? So that we could we would always only talk about what's not working and what I worry about, so we could tackle those things. And we started building the same trust that we had with our co-founders. Before they became big problems, we were talking about solving problems. Suddenly, the big problem wasn't that big of like a deal. It, it wasn't like a surprise. Da da! Here's the big problem. Now let's work together. No, we were working about, you know, this one guy is problematic. We need to figure out what we do. Do we let him go, or what do we do about fundraising in 12 months' time, or very small things like, hey, our go-to-market strategy is not working here. What can we do? And the one thing I also did, which I also encourage you to do, is I shared our board deck with our whole team 
every time after the board meeting, except the HR slide where we had people matters. And everybody in the company knew how much money we had. They knew we would go actually bankrupt in six months and nobody left because they had seen the same slide. They could make the math. Oh, you know what? In three months' time, there's going to only be six months' time left. And nobody left. Guess what? I was really scared. Oh my God, six months, they're going to bail. They had seen the same deck every month and they knew the money's going out. And then we turn it around three months later. And then six months later, we're making a million a month and we were not going bankrupt. Then six months later, David bought my company. So, you know, it all worked out. But again, the, here, the, maybe, the, maybe the key lesson is you build the trust. To show you trust people, whether it be your co-founders, your investors, before the problems hit, because then you build trust and they trust you can solve those problems together. But by the way, just a word of warning, not every board has your back. So build the trust and kind of evaluate a little bit, because if you have a lot of doubts, not every board is going to be there supporting you. So exercise on caution. OK, this is controversial. I believe you shouldn't talk about your doubts with the whole team. Some people will adequate open, openness, and I applaud that. I don't believe in that, because the moment you tell people, oh, I have doubts about this direction, I'm not sure it's going to work out. You know what happens? The motivation's gone, and you made it a self-fulfilling prophecy. You told them not to believe anymore, and they don't believe, and suddenly, it died. So to me, the time to talk about your doubts is when you've decided that it's time to go to a pivot. Then you need to be open. You need to explain both the what and the why, and you really need to engage people. But not when you're like, eh, I'm not quite sure. That's not the time to talk with your team about this. With your co-founders at board, yes, but not the whole team. Third, fourth tool, um, you know, obviously very famous by Geoffrey Moore. Um, no, sorry, no, not so. Andy, Andy. That only the parents survive. And this is a more tactical tool. So when you're starting to think about, oh my God, Maybe things are not going to work out. So what tools can you use? These are very, very practical things. So you can play the devil's advocate. You know your company better than everybody else. If you were attacking your company, how would you attack your company? What would go wrong? Like challenge yourself, like play the other side. Like, okay, you know, you see, I'm going to kick your ass. Like, this is how I'm going to do it. And then figure out how you're going to stop that from happening. That's basically also the same as saying role playing. What will your companies do? What do they know? What resources do they have? Where are they going to? What are your customers doing? Why are they doing those things? And a similar tactical tool is uh, scenario planning. If A happens and then B happens, what will we do? What will our customers do? But these are like practical tools you can apply at the moment when you're starting to think about a thing. These are not something I would recommend you do all the time. It is really about when you start thinking about, oh, we, maybe we need to pivot, but let's examine this problem. It's more fundamental to have the mindset, the duality, and to, to be a leader and learner. And then we go down to the priority of these tools. OK, let's talk about when to pivot. This is a trick question. When to pivot? Who knows? Who knows? You know. You are the only person that knows. Like Nobody on this stage will actually know when you need to pivot. When you use these kind of tools that you are challenging yourself to learn, you're pushing yourself to alternate viewpoints, you're challenging the truths that you hold dear at the company. It feels, it feels like pressure. Like, for me, it was always like little things piling up and pressure is building up. It's like a bottle that's getting, being shaked and shaked and shaked. And it's not quite ready to explode. And it's like, ah, it doesn't feel quite right, but we're still going here. And then suddenly, pop. And my opinion shifted completely, like, oh, oh. We're not going there anymore. That may be different for other people, but for me, it was always like this. I gathered information, I challenged myself, and eventually, the pressure was too much to ignore. And suddenly, my mind shifted to not believing anymore, saying, oh, oh, actually, no, we have to go there. But only you really will know when it's time, but you need this tooling in order to know when the time is. But a huge word of warning. Pivots are dangerous. A pivot can easily kill your company. Why? Because you lose momentum. By definition, you're doing something new. You were going there, now you stop, you need to go somewhere else. You need to rebuild your momentum. You lose the work you've done so far. You know, you might have spent a year building something and psh, you toss it over the border. Oh, what do we do now? 
but more importantly, your team is going to be so confused. You had the time to gather that information, to build up the pressure, and suddenly the team is like, wow, you just told us yesterday we're going here, now we're going there. What's happening here? Can we trust you? Why are you doing this thing? What's happening? And this is really, really hard for the team. And maybe you just say to new hotness, hey, it's crypto, Web3, metaverse, let's go, baby. And you might be wrong again. By pivot means that you were wrong. You just add meaning you were wrong. Maybe you're wrong again. So really do this as a pretty extreme measure. There's a time when it's an easy decision, which is when basically COVID hits. You're doing an events business like Slush, COVID comes along. This is the easy pivot because there's no other choice and your team understands this. This is the only time when pivots absolutely always make sense. But I hope you never encounter situations like this because then it's forced upon you, you don't have control. But this is the only time it's easy. Every other time it's hard. And here's a couple of things that might tell you need to pivot. And by the way, for every single one of these, there's a counter example of persevering. Your customer needs change, you cannot serve them. Huh, yeah, maybe you need to pivot. Growth, growth goes down, market goes down, investors go away, you know. Then again, it might mean, oh, I'm going to be the last dog standing, and by the way, I'm going to figure out new customers in the segment, and by the way, because we have new customers, our business is going to grow again, and because our competitors are going away, it's going to be better. So it's not clear cut. These are just possible signs. Secondly, these are all the mental signs. Like you're pushing and pushing and pushing, and no, the market is not, it's not, it's not pulling things out from your company. And you feel it's getting harder and harder and harder the more you're trying to get the same results. And, well, you know, if you don't believe, well, doof. And, by the way, you're running out of money. Do you think this is a good sign of pivot? It's not necessarily. I had two examples of running out of money. One, we pivoted away from games to doing cross-promotion, and, and that worked fantastically and it was the right decision. The other time, we were running out of money. I need to start firing people in three months, and we persevered, we pushed, and we sold, and it worked out. There is no clear sign for this. You have to do it, the homework yourself. So only you know when the time is. OK, so mindset, when to pivot, and the number one thing that matters with your pivot. And I'm sure every single one of you already know what that one thing is, because it's your team. Nothing else matters in the, at the moment of pivot. Now, your customers actually don't matter. That means you're kind of leaving your customers behind to some extent. The main thing is to get your team behind this pivot. And if they're not fully on board, if they don't understand what's happening and why, why is it happening, you might as not well pivot, probably. You really, this is the number one thing you need to invest time on. I'm a strong believer that in this moment, the why matters more than the what. The new direction is super important, but the why and the what are used to help rebuild the worldview. We were going there, now we're going here. But why? 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 Why are we doing this? You need to go multiple levels deep and really help them understand your decision making, not just the result of decision making, but why did you make the decision? How did you make this decision? This is time for the openness. I said before, don't talk with your team about your doubts, but when you decide, then there's nothing but openness. You, you were wrong, and they know you were wrong. You cannot hide that thing. So now you need to know them, that you know that where you're going is right again, and why is it right, and why should they believe you in you. So you need to share the process, how you learned, what did you learn, how did you come to the decision, and what is the conclusion. And this is time to also give room. You are setting the vision, but now it's time to, to discuss be open to challenges and debate, because there will be those. And if you shut those down, they're not going to get on board. You're helping them rebuild their trust in you, which means you have to debate. You have to be challenged. You're going to engage. But at the same time, be very careful that you don't water it down. This is the new direction. It is set. We're going there. If you need to, the analogy is burn the boats, which means you fire your customer and say, we're not doing that, we're going there, and we're actually not talking to those customers anymore. We are changing the direction. But if you learn something from your team that makes you adjust your decision, 
engage it, beat it in, and change the direction, but only if you now believe that a micro pivot is needed. So you are really now going to work with your team to refine that pivot to be a better pivot. But you are going there. Because now if you've ordered done, oh, we're actually not going to do it. No, I, I hear you, we're not going to do it. Then you were really, really wrong to start the pivot. And you, then you are pivoting back, and suddenly you have made such a mess for yourself. OK, number one thing, communicate, 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 communicate. And you do it until you're sick of it. And do you know do what you do after that? You communicate a little bit more. Because if I learned one thing from my former boss, John Riccitello, who now runs uh, Unity, it is that there is no such thing as talking about strategy and where we're going too much. You're sick of it. You know it so deeply, but the team doesn't get it until they're sick of hearing it. Then we'll tell you, see, we get it. OK, now we get it. And you're going to build momentum. Go fast with the lean startup. Execute faster. Smaller start wins. Move with the willing. Some people are not going to move very rapidly. Move with the people who are ready to go. And you support those people who are willing to go and build those small wins fast. OK, so those are the three things. The duality of schizophrenia, you will prevail, but you will face reality. When you're a learner and a leader, you will know when to pivot. And the number one thing is your team. And I wish you were going to be cockroaches because you're going to be unkillable. You can take over the world. And you can find me with questions and comments at UCL and UCLNoise.com. Thank you so much. <laughs>